glad you're here. If you're watching online, we're uh, glad you're watching. Good to see the uh, balcony crew up there high, high and lifted up. Uh, also want to welcome our friends from uh, Westview Christian down the road in Albany who have come to worship with us today for the last several weeks, several months. Uh, we've been exploring some ways to maybe partner together, so we're excited to have uh, some of them with us uh, this morning. If you have your Bible or your phone, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 3. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you about something that I'm really excited about. Uh, as the month of July winds down, it means we're getting closer to the start of this year's college football season. Now, I know for some of you that, that doesn't register, you know, on your to-do list, but for a lot of us, uh, it's a fun time of year. And this year's season actually kicks off earlier than any in history. The first game will be on August the 24th. That means that for the last several days, teams all over the country have been busy preparing for the upcoming season in what's known as their preseason training camp. So they're working on conditioning, they're watching film, uh, they're trying to learn the playbook. If they've got any lingering injuries from last season, they're trying to get ready, get rid of those so they can be ready for this year's first game. And every team starts training camp with the same vision. Everybody envisions, you know, going undefeated, win every game, and hold up a trophy at the end of the year. And most of them understand that in order for that vision to become a reality or to have any hope of becoming a reality, they have to get busy now preparing for the journey. In recent years, there's been another piece of the puzzle, though, that's been added to a lot of teams' uh, preseason preparations. It's a process known as visualization. Now, Coach Ryan made a point of telling me after the first service that he was doing this 30 years ago. And over the last 30 years, it started in the Olympics, but this has become a part of a lot of teams, a lot of athletes' preparation process. The U.S. Olympic Committee, for example, and now in addition to all the medical staff and all the coaches they employ, they now have dozens of psychologists who work with athletes and train them in this process of, of visualization. And the way it works is really simple. They encourage the athletes, envision, dream about how it is you want to perform in your event or in an upcoming game. So you get this picture in your mind of how you want to play, and you're encouraged to go into as much detail as possible as you think about it. And then over time, once you get that picture established in your mind, you just keep rehearsing it in your mind. You keep going through it as many times as possible. And somehow after you have that picture established in your mind, it helps you perform to that level. Now that may sound strange to you, but over the last few years, there have been several studies that have shown there's something to this. For example, one exercise physiologist from the Cleveland Clinic conducted a study in which he had a group of volunteers over a period of four weeks imagine what it would be like to, to flex their biceps as hard as they could at several different intervals throughout the day. Now, keep in mind, they never actually flex their biceps. They just imagined what it would feel like if they were to flex their biceps. After four weeks, they called everybody back in. They discovered that the people who followed through, listen to this, actually showed a 13.5% increase in strength just from imagining what it would be like to flex their biceps. So since I read that, I've been imagining what it would be like to be tall, dark, and handsome. And uh, unfortunately, there's not been much progress yet, but, but I'm not giving up. One Olympic diver, Troy Dumas, described the process of visualization like this. He said, it's like a painting. A painter doesn't know the finished painting. They have an idea. If they can see it, form it, and make it happen, that imagery work is what makes it happen. It's the same thing with diving. If you can see yourself hitting a dive, the chances of you hitting a dive increase greatly. Now, because of some of the results they've seen, this is sort of branched out, and it's more than athletes now. It's CEOs, professional musicians, actors. A lot of different people are using this, this tool. And as strange as it may sound, many psychologists will tell you that visualization is the, is the difference between an average performer and a great performer. If you have your Bible open to Ephesians 3, what you'll see 
is part of a letter written by a guy named Paul to a little church that meets in a city called Ephesus. And in this letter, and particularly in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul helps us visualize what a church could be and what a church should be. In the first 13 verses, as you break this down, he reminds his readers about the, the mission of the church, why it is the church exists, what the church is supposed to be doing. And he summarizes it this way in Ephesians 3, verse 6. Here's what he says. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, you read that, and the tendency for us is to, to read that a little too quickly, to sort of skim over that, because to be honest, the terms Jews and, and Gentiles don't mean much in our world, but that was the kind of statement that in the first century would have stopped people in their tracks. In their world, people were divided into two categories. First, you had the Jews, or Israel, as Paul refers to them, and these were God's chosen people. These were the people that, that God was thought to be you know, most interested in. These were people that grew up going to the synagogue. They, they knew all the songs. They memorized big pieces of the scripture. And these were the people that were considered to be the insiders when it came to their relationship with God. And then you had the Gentiles, which was anybody that was, was not a Jew, and these were the, the religious outsiders. These are the people, they didn't grow up going to the synagogue. They didn't know the words to the songs. You know, they'd never been to Bible school. They didn't know what Sunday school was. They hadn't memorized any of the scriptures. And for the most part, there was this clear line of separation where the outsiders never got invited to be a part of what the insiders were doing. That was the way it had always been. And they assumed that was the way it would always be. But then Jesus comes along and he does something that nobody would have expected. And if you go back and you look at how Jesus spent his time, you'll notice that he spent a lot more time trying to connect with the outsiders than he did pandering to the insiders. Over and over again, Jesus said his mission was to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come to earth to help good people become better people. Make sure you understand. He didn't come to help religious insiders become more comfortable with other insiders. Instead, he came to help people who were spiritually dead become alive. He came to help people who were outside the circle be adopted into God's family. Now, you fast forward to the end of his life, and Jesus makes it clear that it was his desire, his goal, that the church would continue working toward the fulfillment of that mission. So from the very beginning, the church was always meant to be a place where every single person, regardless of their background, you know, regardless of their family history, regardless of any mistakes they may have made in their past, could come and be adopted into God's family. That's why when Paul sat down to write this letter, he took a moment and he repainted that picture. Because here's what happens. Just like a painting over time that fades, sometimes you have to go back and, and retouch some parts so you can see what it was supposed to look like from the very beginning. So that's what he does. He paints this picture of a church in which insiders and outsiders can come together. It's a place where insiders can come and grow close to one another and worship together, but it's also a place that attracts people who are outside the circle. Now, here's what I know is true of most of us here today. The kind of church that Paul describes here is the kind of church that all of us want to be a part of. I mean, if I gave you a piece of paper and said, I want you to write down your description of the perfect church, my suspicion is this is the kind of church you would describe. You'd probably describe a church in which people love God, they love each other, they take care of each other, you know, the, the parking lot's full, the Sunday school classes are full of laughter, people are encouraging one another, they're building one another up, but it's also a place where people who are far from God can come and experience the grace of God. I mean, that's the kind of church that all of us want to be a part of, and my suspicion is all of us would probably describe a different angle of the same picture. That's what most of us dream about whenever we dream about what a church could be and should be. But there's a problem with that kind of visualization. As I've been reading about this over the last few days, I've learned there's, there's one common mistake that people make whenever they try to employ this, this process. Athletes make this mistake, business leaders make it, and I'm convinced I've made this mistake, and, and maybe you have too. And here's the mistake we make. A lot of times when it comes to visualizing the future or, or dreaming about the future, we focus on the results and not the process. 
Let me explain what I mean by that. We try and envision this future. We spend all of our time trying to imagine our preferred outcome, but we rarely think about what it will take to get there. So, for example, it's one thing if I go home and I sit in my easy chair in the corner and I'd sit there and try and visualize what it would be like to be in great shape. That doesn't work, just in case you, you're interested. Um, it's something different to think about the, the push-ups and the setups and the, the cardio work it's going to take to get there. It's one thing, you know, if I want to dream about sitting down at the piano and, you know, playing anything that I wanted to play. It's something different to, to visualize all those hours of practice. In a church, the same thing's true. It, it's one thing to, to sit around and dream about what it would be like to be a part of a church that was thriving, you know, and really impacting a region. It's something different to see yourself doing what it takes to get there. So how do you get there? That's the question that Paul answers starting in verse 14. He shows us three things that we need to pursue and keep in mind as we read this, he's not describing the end result. He's already described that. He's describing the process of what it takes to get there. Verse, verse 14 of Ephesians 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. As this section opens, Paul takes the perspective of a, of a spiritual father. And because of that, he's not content for these people to just sort of go through the motions. I mean, he wants them to really experience something. So to that end, he prays for three very specific things as they move forward. Here, here's the first one, if you're keeping track. If you want to have an impact on the world around them, they're going to need to pursue ongoing personal transformation. Verse 16, here's what he says. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, I don't know how many of you shop, you know, on Amazon, but I download a lot of books from Amazon onto my iPad. And one of the interesting things that happens, and you've may have, you may have seen this, is when you do that, Amazon starts tracking your interest. You ever notice that? So, like, if you buy something, let's say you buy a book about some historical figure, the next time you get on there, there'll be two or three different items connected to that historical figure that are all, you know, recommended for you to purchase. You, you know what I'm talking about? So it's kind of creepy, you know, when you think about it. So I usually don't pay much attention to it. But, but recently I got on there and I noticed there were four or five really strange books that were recommended for me. And they're based off stuff, apparently, that I have bought in the past. So it kind of weirded me out. So I thought I'd show you a couple of these. Here, here's the first one that came up. Uh, the title of this is Food, A Love Story. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, where that comes from or why that was recommended for me. I mean, it's true. I do love food, but I did not purchase that. But if you want to purchase it, it's there. Here's a second one. How to Be Pope. Uh, there again, not sure where that came from, but I did click on this one. Here, here's what it said. Here you will find the facts, figures, and historical anecdotes that will give you all of the crucial information you'll need to fulfill your papal duties. So there again, I, if you aspire to be the Pope one day, uh, you might check that out. Here's a third one. Me Talk Pretty One Day. Now this is actually a, a famous book. Uh, in fact, it's going to be made into a movie in the next year, so you, you know if you're into that, you might want to check it out. Now, before I show you the next one, i got to set this up for you. This is one that somebody sent me, okay? This is not one that showed up on Amazon. This is one that somebody thought I could relate to. You ready? Let's show me. Uh, how to lose a person's interest in 10 seconds. Um, I wrote back and told them, I've been in ministry long enough. I've got this one down. So uh, if, if you're into that, 
But, you know, you, you've seen these, these weird books, you know, supposed to help you become, you know, the best version of yourself. Well, I want you to understand, what, what Paul's talking about here is not self-improvement. It's, it's, it's not self-help. He's not praying that, that you'd become a better version of yourself. He's, he's not worried about how you talk and what you eat and whether or not you can hold people's attention. He's focused on who you are in the deepest part of your soul. He doesn't want you to become an improved version of yourself. Make sure you understand that. He wants you to become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, here's the way he says it. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. He's describing the situation in which the longer you, you walk with Jesus, the more you trust in Jesus, that over time, God begins to transform you more and more into the image of Jesus. So all of a sudden, you start to think like he thinks. So we got all these, you know, hot button topics that dominate the airwaves. All of a sudden, instead of listening to the 24-7 voices of our culture, you begin to view those issues like God views those issues. You begin to, to look at each issue through the lens of what he said. You begin to value the things that, that he values. You begin to give like he gives. You begin to talk to the people around you like he would talk to the people around you. You begin to serve in ways that you never dreamed possible. And all of that happens not because you're good, because you're not good. It happens because God is changing you from the inside out. He's not improving you. He's transforming you. And Paul says if you want to have an impact on the people around you, it starts with you putting yourself in a position for God to continually transform you. Here's the second thing he says we need to pursue. A greater understanding of of Christ's love. Verse 17, he says it like this, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now that verb to grasp literally means to understand or to, app to apprehend. And obviously when it comes to the gospel, you're never going to understand it totally, but the idea is that as you grow in your faith, you understand it at a deeper level. Paul says that, that trying to understand God's love is like trying to measure the immeasurable. You can't do it. You can't wrap your mind around it. One writer said it like this, the gospel is so simple that small children can understand it, and yet it's so profound that even the wisest philosopher will never exhaust its riches. But here's something I want to be clear on. Make sure you understand this. Understanding Christ's love does not just mean that you're able to talk about it intelligently. So I don't know if you notice this or not. You and I live in a unique time in history in which because of the internet, you know, the growth of social media, uh, everybody now considers themselves an expert on everything. Have you noticed that? No matter what topic comes up, it could be anything, a political issue, a historical event, a art, music, movies, all you have to do, you pull your phone out, you, know, you go to Google, you go to Wikipedia, and in five minutes, you've convinced yourself that you're an expert on whatever that topic is. It's all right there at your fingertips. In, in many ways, we live under the illusion of expertise. And, and what you'll find is there are a lot of people, like the less they know about something, the more certain they are about it. You, you know people like that? You live with people like, no, don't say that. Uh, but, but you know what I'm saying. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing when it comes to the gospel. Some of you are like me. You grew up as an insider. I mean, you went to church, but every time the doors are open, you were there. You've heard all the stories. You know the motions to all the songs. You can recite all the memory verses. You might even know the pledge to the Christian flag from VBS. I mean, you've got all the information. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm saying there's some of us, you can't remember the first time you heard certain Bible stories because it's, it's always been a part of it. And that's not a bad thing, but it can be a dangerous thing because just because you know the stories and just because you can identify some of the characters doesn't mean you're an expert doesn't mean you got all this figured out. If you read through the book of Ephesians, Paul makes it clear that understanding Christ's love is not a matter of being able to talk about it. It's a matter of doing the things that God has designed you to do. 
In Ephesians 2.10, he says it like this. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To talk about it? No, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the question you have to ask yourself is not, do I understand the basic story of the gospel? That's a good place to start. But once you got that, you have to ask yourself, am I living my life in a way that helps other people experience Christ's love? And if I'm not, then that's something I need to begin pursuing on a daily basis. Here's a third thing Paul says you need to pray for. It's a deeper experience of God's presence. Verse 19, he prays, And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. One of the magazines that I read on a regular basis is the old magazine, The Atlantic. Earlier this week, they had an interesting article up. I took a, a picture of the headline because I wanted to show it to you. It said, they, they tried to start a church without God, and for a while, it worked. The article told the story of 40-year-old Justina Walford. She grew up what we would consider a religious insider. Her family was part of a church. She grew up in the youth ministry and all that goes with that, just like your experience. In her mid-20s, though, late 20s, she made a decision to, to walk away from her faith. She sort of had a crisis of belief. She sort of shut the door on all that. And then in her early 30s, she moved to New York City. And when she got there, she discovered that she was missing some of the connections, some of the relationships that she'd experienced when she was a part of a church. So she wasn't ready, you know, to jump back into her spiritual life, but she found an alternative known as the Sunday Assembly. You may have read about this. It's a movement that started in Great Britain back in 2013, was quickly exported to America. It's described as a, as a gathering of people who get together on Sundays and they, they sing popular songs together, they listen to a lecture of some sort, and then they eat uh, coffee and donuts. Sounds a lot like what we do in church. The only difference is there's no mention of God at these gatherings. It's designed to be a church for people who are not interested in pursuing a relationship with God. If you can remember a few years ago, this was getting a lot of press. Uh, 2014, the, the number of these assemblies doubled, went from 35 to 75 meeting in, in major cities all over the United States, really grew in popularity. But, but what they've discovered is that over the last four or five years, instead of continuing to grow, most of these assemblies have now disbanded, including the one where Miss Walford went in New York City. And what they've discovered is that while people will gather for a little while, you know, to, to sing, you know, Bon Jovi songs and listen to somebody talk about some random topic, uh, eventually they want something more. See, what people crave is not to be entertained. What they crave is an experience with God. And Miss Wolford, for her part, she relocated to Dallas just last year, is now slowly becoming a part of a church there. So I was reading this article, and I just I wrote down a question to myself, because I do that sometimes. I wrote down, have I ever tried to go through the motions of following God without really seeking to experience God? Have you ever done that? Have you ever got up on a Sunday and approached going to worship service just like you were you know, going to a, you know, a concert in the park and some random person is going to give a speech and it's all going to be kind of mediocre? I mean, have you ever done that rather than then approaching it as if it were a real opportunity to experience God. You ever done that? I'll be honest. I have. A lot more than I should have. And Paul makes it clear that if you and I want to have an impact on the people around us, it's going to take a lot more than us just doing our best to entertain people and motivate them to do better. One leader in the Sunday Assembly movement made this statement in the article. Listen to what he said. He said, we're trying to make the weekly meeting so interesting, so entertaining, so powerful that people will keep showing up. We're convinced that the quality of the content is what keeps people coming back. But here's what they've discovered. As hard as they work to make that happen, it takes more than that. It takes an experience with God. 
And when Paul wrote these words to that little group of people in Ephesus, his goal, his desire was that every person in that little church would experience this as an ongoing reality in their lives. He wanted them to experience God at such a deep and profound level that it changed them from the inside out. He wanted them to understand Christ's love at such a deep level that they couldn't help but live in such a way that reflected that love to the people around them. If you're like me, you read that and you think to yourself, you know, I want that too. I want to be a part of a church that does that. And then there's another thought that quickly enters your mind that goes like this. You ask yourself, could it really be that way? Could this really happen? Could my life look like this? Could my church be a place where this is normal? That's why I love this passage. You keep reading. You get to verse 20. And Paul anticipates that question. And then he answers it. Look at what he says in verse 20. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Two words I want you to underline or circle, whatever it is you do in your Bible. The two words are immeasurably more. I don't know what it is you dream about, when you dream about what your, your future could look like. And I don't know what it is you dream about when you dream about what this church could look like. I mean, I've got some dreams of my own, but I don't know what it is you dream. But here's what I'll make sure you understand. If you don't get anything else, this is it. This is, the, this is the bottom line. Whatever it is you imagine, whatever it is you dream about, I can promise you God wants to do more. He wants to do more. In fact... Believe what Paul said. He wants to do immeasurably more. Thursday of this next week, August 1st, will be eight years since I came to Monticello. When I got here, I was tall, dark, and handsome. And you can see, don't laugh at that. That hurts. Um, it was 2011 when I started here. And for those of you who have been here for most of that time, a lot of you weren't here, but if you've been here throughout that time, you know God has done some really cool things. And make sure you understand, it wasn't me, it's not our staff, it's, it's not our elders, it's anything good that's happened has been, been done by God. And over the last uh, few years, uh, as a church, we've, we've caught a glimpse of what's possible. I mean, in many ways, we, we've tasted what it could be like to to impact the, the region around us. And, and now as a church, we're going to enter into a fall season in just a few weeks, and the, the future's going to look different from the past. And as hard as we try to envision, as hard as we try to, to paint the picture in our minds, it's hard because we don't see the whole picture. We see glimpses of it, but we don't see the whole painting. But here's what I know is true. Whatever it is you can imagine, God wants to do more. Whatever it is we as a church hope to accomplish in the coming months and years, God wants to do more. However many people you want to see come here, however many baptisms you want to see, however many uh, little kids you want to see running around and you know, hearing about the Lord, however many services you want to have to fit the people in, however many baptisms you want to experience, God wants to do more. He wants, he wants us to have a, an impact on our region that's greater than anything that we can imagine. He wants to do immeasurably more. This uh, Sunday, we're concluding a series that we've been in throughout the summer months. We've called it our Summer Playlist. And during these past few weeks, we've been just taking some songs that we sing on a normal basis and talking about the stories and the meanings behind those songs. And this week, admittedly, we've approached it a little different, but back in 2010, there was a song written by two guys, Reuben Morgan and Ben Fielding, who were associated with a church down in Australia known as Hillsong. And the story behind the song is that the church was preparing to enter into a new season, a new year. They were planning their annual uh, staff planning retreat. And the preacher there, a guy named Brian Houston, who's a famous preacher, he asked two of his worship leaders uh, to write a song that would serve as an anthem 
for the church over the coming months. Now, they were in a situation, thousands of people coming. They committed to starting several new churches all over the world and several new uh, mission initiatives. And to be honest, they were in a situation where the money was a little bit tight. And they were starting to wonder if maybe they hadn't bit off more than they could chew. So the worship team got together. They started praying together and dreaming together. And after a couple days, they, they found themselves captivated by what Paul wrote in Ephesians 3. And they started writing this song. And the finished product was a song that we sing titled, God is Able. And what makes this story interesting, though, is in just a few weeks of writing that song, 2011 rolled in. And you can go back and look this up. Their home country, Australia, was struck by a series of almost unbelievable natural disasters. Historic flooding, multiple tornadoes, two earthquakes, and a massive tsunami, all in a period of months. And within that time period, almost everybody in their church was suffering because of the events of those months. So now instead of worrying about how to raise money to do all the things they wanted to do, they're worrying about how to house their people and where their next meal's coming from. It was during that time that the words to this song took on a whole different meaning. Reuben Morgan, the writer, said it like this. He said, those three little words became our anchor in the storm. What started out as a song of celebration ended up sustaining us through our desperation. Now, some of you here this morning may feel like you're in a desperate spot. And if that's your situation, I want you to know that God is able to change it. He's the only one that is, but, but he can do it. The second verse of the song reads like this. God is with us. He's on our side. He'll make a way far above all we know, far above all we hope. He's done great things. And the implication is because he's done great things in the past, he can do great things in the future. And if you're at a point where you can't do anything else, I just want you to listen to those three words and just, just repeat them to yourself every day. Just say, God's able. God is able. God is able. For, the, for others of you here, though, that may not be your situation. Maybe you're at a point where you're ready for God to do more in you and through you. Maybe the last few years, last few months, you've just sort of been scratching the surface of what's available, and now you're ready to take that, that next step. And if that's your situation, if that describes you, then I want you to know that God wants to do more in you and through you than you can imagine. He wants to do whatever it is you're thinking about. He wants you to do more. He wants to do immeasurably more than all you can ask or imagine. But in order for that to happen, you have to put yourself in a position for him to work. That means you're going to have to pursue him to a greater degree than maybe you've ever done. You're going to have to, to put your focus on him in a way that you've never done before. And when you do that, the promise is that he'll come in and he'll do what only he can do. I want you to stand. We're going to have a brief invitation. We're going to sing this song together, and as we do, I want to invite you to use it as a springboard for your own prayer. Uh, if you need to talk with somebody, pray with somebody, you want to make a public decision, David and I will be here. You just meet us on this front row and do whatever it is that you need to do.